And I'm especially pleased to be here as we welcome Nathaniel Philbrick again to Politics and Prose as we celebrate the publication of Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution. I wanted to do this event tonight because I'm a Philbrick fan, first having read Mayflower a few years ago. And for those who are interested, there are many Philbrick books out front. Uh, some of the earlier books, as well as Mayflower and The Last Stand, and um, it, it, in addition to Bunker Hill. Um, and they all make good Father's Day presents, and good graduation presents, and good bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah presents. So it's not limited to men. Uh, a venture of uh, pilgrimage to Massachusetts was Mayflower, and it was so different from the history that I knew that here we were dealing uh, Nathaniel Philbrook was dealing with this biblical mission that got cut, caught up in war and massacre and lots of sadness. And he, he found special heroes, people we might say are patriots, who refused to succumb or surrender to the dominant passion. And they're the heroes who brought the war to an end between the Indians, the English, and the settlers. What Nathaniel Philbrick does that's so wonderful for me is that he explores myth and sees how it relates to facts or creates facts. So for example, President Lincoln established our Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I've also read Nathaniel Philbrick's Why We Should Read Moby Dick, which I found to be a gem after I had read Moby Dick a second time a couple of years ago when I was spending some time in New Bedford. And I, of course, I learned why it was wasted on me in college. <laughs> Bunker Hill is an important book at any time, and especially now when we think of the recent tragic violence in Boston. Boston, Bunker Hill period, resisted British draconian acts and persevered for liberty. But what Nathaniel Philbrick has done in an insightful and truthful way is he has showed us um, that there can be balance in understanding historical figures. General Gage protected the civil liberties of the Boston citizens as a British general. Um, he understood some of the baser ambitions of leaders we celebrate. Uh, so the rebels are not glorified, nor are the loyalists castigated. And one of the other things he's done, as he did for me in Mayflower, is he's given us a neglected leader, Dr. Joseph Warren, paid with his life. As Nathaniel Philbrick suggests, the committees of correspondence, which were an early example of social media, still needed the militia men and Paul Revere to get the revolution started and completed. You have written a book that connects our past to the present. For that, we are grateful. Let us welcome Nathaniel Philbrick to Politics and Prose. Well, thank you. It is great to be here once again. And uh, this is, has to be one of the greatest stores on the planet. And it's great to see it flourishing uh, so well. And let's see, where did this all begin for me? It began in fifth grade when I read that great book, Johnny Tremaine. God bless Esther Forbes. This was the first book I ever read where I go, wow, somebody, the people in the past, in like historic events, it's not just dates and dust, it's actual people. Kids like me, like this Johnny, he was an ordinary person caught up in an extraordinary event, and I, I just found it captivating. And uh, let's fast forward to 1984. Uh, I, my wife and I, uh, we at that time had an 18-month-old child named Jenny. We moved to Boston. We moved to the, the place of Johnny Tremaine, and we uh, moved to the North End, the historic North End. And I, I am a a uh, sailing journalist at this time, but my primary responsibility is taking care of my daughter. So I spent a lot of time pushing her stroller through the crooked streets of the North End. And I was fascinated with 
this place, and particularly Copps Hill Graveyard. If you've ever been there, it's, it's up on the hill overlooking the north end. Crooked stones, it just evokes everything. There's uh, a, a, one of the gravestones has chips in it that, according to legend, were caused by the British regulars when they used it for target practice. I mean, it's just all there. And so I became interested in the history of Boston. And so I developed a routine on Sundays. I'd take the subway, the T in Boston, to the Boston Public Library and start researching the history of Boston. And this was really where my interest in history began. And I was most interested in the topography because if you've driven into Boston, you know uh, it bears absolutely no resemblance to what it was in the pre-revolutionary era. At that point, it was a 1.2 square mile island dominated by three hills of almost mountainous proportions, a town of 15,000 packed into two neighborhoods, the north end, as pretty much as it is now, and the south end, which is now dominated by skyscrapers and, and the financial district, connected only by a thin neck of land known as the Neck, actually, to the town of Roxbury on the mainland. And this neck was so thin that uh, at high tide, some of it lapped over. I mean, it was, this was truly an island, and an island, one of dozens of islands in Boston Harbor that surrounded it. And so I when I began to work on this book, I wanted to create what, to try to channel what Boston was like. And there are some, some structures that still exist. There's the Old South Meeting House. If you take Washington Street in, that was the largest gathering place uh, in Boston. On the, the night of the Boston Tea Party, more than 5,000 people, a third of the town, were gathered in that structure. And you go on a little farther, you come to the, what's now known as the Old State House, known as the State House, uh, as the Townhouse in the pre-revolutionary era. This was where the legislative body, the general court, met. And it's all there. And so I, uh, uh, one of the things I did was I uh, got some historic maps, um, many of them made by the British when they were occupying Boston, and blew them up to poster size, put them on poster board, and put them around my desk. Uh, and with pencil in hand was, would, okay, so this is John Adams' house, this is Sam Adams' house, trying to put it all together. And from the beginning, uh, there were the series of surprises. You know, I think many of us, uh, when we came out of high school thought of the revolution as it was pretty cut and dried. It was what we would call patriots, people who would eventually become revolutionaries, and the loyalists, those that were true to England. But that is really a, 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 a simplification. Uh, there was, you know, what's been written out is the ambivalence of that many people had. There were there's those two poles, but there was also of the largest group, which was undecided. They really didn't know what they thought about these issues on either side. Most of them wanted things to stay pretty much the way they had been, because when you looked at it in a cold, a cold fashion, these Bostonians and colonists throughout America were some of the freest, least taxed people in America, in, in the English empire. Uh, but there, and it was, there was an aspect to this, this um, growing tension that was also very personal. It wasn't just an issue of taxation and representation. There were old animosities that reached very deep uh, in the town. This town was founded in 1630 by Puritans who had come so that they could worship in the way they had wanted. They were looking for autonomy from the very beginning. And when I uh, was working on Mayflower, I was astonished to see that in 1676, exactly a century before all of this would unfold, Governor Leverett told an agent of the Crown uh, that uh, basically their general court uh, was more powerful in their colony than the Parliament in England. And if the king wanted to provide them with more liberties, that would be fine. It was exactly what would be said by their great-grandchildren a hundred years later. There were just a lot of what was coming out of New England was profoundly conservative. What they wanted was their society to stay the way it had always been, while Britain was the one looking to move in a more modern direction. They were trying to modernize their empire. They were trying to make it work in a financial way. The French and Indian War had ended in 1763, leaving the Great Britain in approximately $20 billion in debt in 
in modern uh, dollars. And this was a war that had been fought largely on New England's behalf. And so what, New Engl what England was trying to do was make it so that each colony paid for their upkeep in the empire. And people couldn't argue with that. It was how they were going to pay. And with the Tea Party, uh, what is not generally appreciated was there was a slight tax on tea. But the overall price of the tea was a third less than it had been prior to that. And so this was a windfall for the colonial consumer. Uh, but there was, were ideological terms to, to oppose it, mainly because many of the merchants had been making a lot of money in, uh, smuggling in illegal cheap Dutch tea. And when the British government decided to lower the price, they undercut the smugglers. And so this led to their ideological outrage over a three pence tax on tea. Now, the Tea Party occurs in December of 1773. By this time, tensions have begun. We have had the Boston Massacre, the creation of the Boston Committee of Correspondence, by which Samuel Adams created an independent network of communication by which he would send out open letters from the 21-member Boston Committee of Correspondence to the more than 250 towns in Massachusetts, which then included modern Maine. What they were doing was turning the town meeting, in which usually you discussed road maintenance and putting up bridges and things like that, into forums in which the issues of the day were discussed. And so as the Tea Party was bearing down, these, these town meetings were chat rooms in which people were voicing their support of what was going on in Boston. And they were getting extraordinary letters where, for example, from the town of Gorham, uh, now Maine, it was then Massachusetts, just outside Portland. Sixteen years before, that town had been attacked by Indians. Uh, three people killed, two abducted. In their letter to the Boston Committee of Correspondence the previous year, they said, you know, we don't quite get what's going on with Parliament, but we do know about our liberties. We have died for this community. We know, we know, we've seen the blood spilt. Uh, we still farm with our muskets by our side. Our women know how to make cartridges and pour, pour musket balls. The swords are still sharpened if we must once again defend our liberties. And so what Samuel Adams and the other patriot leaders were realizing was, yes, there was, Boston was a center of defiance, patriot defiance, but the real radicals were in the country towns, as they were known. And unlike the citizens of Boston, each one of these towns had a, a militia with a tradition for defending it, those people. The, the, the militias went back into the previous century. The King Philip's War had been involved in the French and Indian Wars ever since then. If it came down to violence, if it came down to a war, they knew they, they had an, a, a potential army. Well, with the institution of the, it was known as the Boston Port Act, which was England's overreaction to the Tea Party. Thomas Gage was a gen British general put, made royal governor and commander of the military forces in America. And he was put in an impossible situation. It was up to him to enforce the Port Act, which closed Boston basically as a commercial entity, providing most Bostonians with no way to support themselves. Instead of feeling subdued, the population became more and more outraged, particularly when thousands of British regulars, professional soldiers, began to arrive in the streets. Tensions were building. Throughout the colonies, Boston was now an example of, of British tyranny. As far away as Charleston, South Carolina, uh, food, food was being delivered to Boston, rice uh, from Charleston, sheep being brought over from Connecticut. Then Parliament really made it difficult for Thomas Gage by passing the Massachusetts Government Act, which meant that the town meeting, the lifeblood of, of New England, was made virtually illegal except for one annual meeting. And, ta and officials that had been formally appointed locally or elected were now appointed by the Crown. Towns throughout Massachusetts went crazy. It was, it was a summer on fire as 
royal appointed officials throughout the province were mobbed uh, by local inhabitants who required them to disavow their appointment or they had to flee to Boston, which was becoming a city of refuge for loyalists. It was about this time that the call went out for the first provincial congress in Philadelphia. And by September, Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, you know, all the names we associate with Boston uh, were off-site, either in Philadelphia or on their way. Things were out of control in New England. Who do you look to? Who would step in? Who would become the de facto leader of the Patriot Movement in Massachusetts? It would be a 33-year-old doctor named Joseph Warren, who is uh, one of the leading characters in my book. Actually, the lead character is Boston itself. That's really what I wanted to focus on. But Joseph Warren is the unsung hero of the American Revolution. He was 33, a widower, with four children between the ages of two and eight. He lived in Boston. You know, we've all heard of Paul Revere, right? Well, did you know who gave Paul Revere the orders to alert the countryside that the British were headed to Concord? It was Joseph Warren, the last patriot leader, still in Boston on April 18th, uh, 1775. He, was, he had a, a swashbuckling aura about him. Errol Flynn would be a great Joseph Warren in a movie. And he, he was, because he was a doctor, he knew people from all walks of life, from prostitutes to the, the most well-off gentry of Boston. And he had this charismatic flair where if he encountered someone who disagreed with him politically, they, he would talk them to them for a while, ask them about their children, all this kind of thing, and they would walk away Loving the guy. We all know that kind of person. He just had that social dynamic that was going to flourish in what the increasing tensions of, of revolutionary Boston. So the we, Gage is overwhelmed by what's happening. We have the outbreak of violence in Lexington and Concord. Warren wakes up in the morning of April 19th, learns of Lexington. He escapes Boston, gets across the Charles River, and immediately goes for the fighting. He, he gets to Lexington as the British troops are returning from Concord, fighting their way literally house to house back towards Boston. Warren was a snappy dresser, apparently, uh, and as was common at that day, he had those horizontal curls in, in his hair that he kept back with a pin. It was in the town, what's now called Arlington, that a musket ball took out one of those pins. He was so close in harm's way. This went around all of Massachusetts. You hear about Joseph Warren? He had a pin knocked out by a, a, a musket ball. With the, uh, finally, the British soldiers make their way to Boston. Boston becomes a city under siege as the patriots leave, the loyalists come in, and thousands of militiamen surround the city centering themselves in Cambridge and Roxbury. Warren uh, is elected president of the Provincial Congress. He becomes the leading personality in the Committee of Safety, which is the, effectively the executive branch of the provincial government. He's running both sides. I mean, he's doing it all. But no one could think of anyone else uh, in Boston with the stature to, to take these roles. He, would, he was the one. He would not only be there helping put together an army and l pass, passing the legislative uh, re resolutions that made this all happen. He was there with the troops. Whenever there was fighting uh, in, in the area, he would be there. In the 60 days leading up to Bunker Hill, he was indispensable. By uh, early June, he was appointed a major general. And then in the night of June 16, 1775, for reasons that are still murky, uh, Colonel William Prescott on a nighttime uh, mission. He was supposed to build an earthen redoubt, a, a roofless fort on Bunker Hill on the Charlestown Peninsula. The hope was to stop, if, if postpone, a planned British breakout that was, would, from the British perspective, hopefully send the provincials reeling. So his job was to build this fort on Bunker Hill, which was set back on the peninsula as a, as a deterrent. Instead, Prescott continues south more than half a mile to the much smaller Breed's Hill, where he builds his redoubt. The next morning, 
Thomas Gage awakes to see this fort right in his figurative face. Instead of postponing an, an attack, it would, it would provoke what would become the bloodiest battle of the revolution. I'm not going to go into the details of the battle. You've got to get the book to find out what happens. But it was, the one thing I will say, it was a, it was a terrifying spectator uh, event in which Bostonians were crowding the roofs of their houses up in the steeples of the churches, watching as 2,000 British regulars were rowed across Boston Harbor, just a quarter mile away, to the Charlestown Peninsula and marching across the green hills towards that earthen redoubt. There would be three different charges. The British would eventually take the redoubt, but the losses were so heavy that they suffered casualties of 50%. William Howe, the general who was leading it on the field, said the success is too dearly bought. And for the patriots, it was equally devastating because Joseph Warren was killed on the last charge. And that is why we don't know about him today. He, he, did not have, he did not live long enough to have the paper trail that historians usually follow. And part of the, he was then eclipsed 10 days later by the appearance of none other than George Washington, who had been appointed leader of the Continental, Con, Continental, the, the Continental Army. And Washington was besieged with culture shock when he arrived in New England. He came from Virginia. He had never seen a, a group of soldiers more dirty, uh, less disciplined than the provincial army. They had a different approach to the military, these militia. They had grown up in town meetings where you, it was consensus. Someone would bring up an idea. People would argue about it, and then everybody would eventually come up with the solution. So when an officer said, we're going to go this, they'd say, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. Let's see. OK, yeah, we'll do that. So this was the attitude uh, George Washington had to deal with. And I, I'm going to end in a slightly um, uh, unusual way by saying, I think it's with George Washington that Amer what, that. 13 colonies will become an American one nation. It begins with a resolution he passed on November 5th, 1775, when he was presented with what he felt was an outrageous proposal by the officers of uh, his, this new army. Boston had a strange holiday on November 5th of every year. It was loosely based on Guy Fawkes Day in England, which was to celebrate the, the foiled plot to blow up Parliament and the King. In Boston, it was a little different. It was known as Poke Night, and it was basically an anti-Catholic fest in which the North and the South End would create carts with caricatures of the Pope and the Devil on each cart, and the object was to steal the other gang's cart while beating them up as much as you could. It was a violent blood sport that Bostonians had lived with for as long as anyone could remember. His officers proposed, let's celebrate Pope Night. Well, this was just when Washington was hoping to include the French Canadians <laughs> to help, help the colonies. This was when overtures were going to Catholic France, trying to bring it. And he goes, wait a minute. He says, how could you propose this foolish spectacle at a time like this? I refused, no. And what he was doing, he was forcing those New Englanders to realize that all their ancient loves and hatreds, their, their very parochial view, were no longer going to cut it if this was going to be a successful army. You began to had, you could no longer think of yourself as from Massachusetts or from New England. You had to begin to think of yourself from America. And it's there that Washington begins to make the change. They, he would eventually force the evacuation of the British on March 1776, and thus would end the siege of Boston. No, does anyone know, A, why the gentleman whose name I've forgotten uh, chose to erect the redoubt on Breed's Hill instead, and B, uh, why is it still called the Battle of Bunker Hill? Yes, uh, William Prescott was his name, and the only the 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 only sort of scrap of information hint we have is from a letter that was written a few days after the battle 
saying that, and there was there was Prescott, and there was uh, a, the the head of artillery, and then there was also uh, another officer, and so there was a discussion among them, and this was Putnam, who was a big guy from England and from New from Connecticut, who was beloved and a real fighter. And it's been generally assumed that he sort of said, hey, don't put it on Bunker Hill. Let's put it on Breed's Hill. Because there was some history of him saying, we've got to force some kind of confrontation to break the stalemate. But the fact of the matter is, it was Prescott who was in charge of the operation. And he was no, he was not someone, he was no pushover. He was not going to be someone to be bullied into the position. And once this was built, he would take, you know, he would lead by example. With it after the remember, this peninsula was surrounded by British warships, all cannon equipped. And as soon as dawn came and they saw this fort, they began firing their cannons. And so cannonballs were sizzling towards this fort. On the and as the men were digging this redoubt, on the fourth cannonball, it uh, it took uh, the head off of one of Prescott's men. His, his compatriots were a little upset, particularly since the officers had assured them that, don't worry, it looks dangerous, but it's not that bad. They wanted to bury him. Prescott said no and jumped to the top of the redoubt and started strutting back and forth, daring the British to fire upon him. I mean, this, and this, he was the one who was there to the very end, telling his men, don't fire till we see the whites of their eyes. Although there's no documentation, we do know someone said, don't fire until you see the whites of their half gators. It doesn't quite have the same ring. But, um, but the point was, they, they had very little powder. They were disciplined enough to wait until the, the British were right upon them before they fired, and that's why the British sustained such, such terrible uh, casualties. Independence was not on anybody's radar screen. Even Samuel Adams and Joseph Warren were not pushing for that. They were pushing to have more representation. And so, um, you know, and this added to the, the whole ambivalence of it. And what happened was the British overreaction uh, made it very hard for those who were in the middle to justify being in the middle. Uh, the, the, more, the, the more severe the response, uh, the more reaction that occurred. And, and you know, the, the, the fact is that outside Boston, the Patriots had a demographic advantage, and they were also, since the, the soldiers, the British soldiers were confined to Boston, they were pretty much free to intimidate those who weren't with them. And, uh, and as one of the British officers said, that the, the, the Patriots make those bend who would just as soon be left alone. And you know, it became a point of no return when finally you had to choose. And that's what a revolution requires. It makes you go one way, are you with us or are you against us? And most people felt uncomfortable with that decision. But as Britain pushed harder and harder and harder, and violence broke out, and it's really with Lexington and Concord. You see, there's a minister who recounted, before Lexington and Concord, my people were as peaceful as lambs. After that, when people they knew had died, they were angry and defiant. It changed everything, and it just built from that. And then Bunker Hill uh, was the one that took a skirmish, and there were people on both sides saying, wait, we can still negotiate our way out of this. After Bunker Hill, it was clear this was on its way to becoming a war. Well, it, it's interesting. There have been a lot of studies about you know, how, how many people on either side, and it, it did vary in terms of region. And you're right, there were more loyalists to the South. It was a more hierarchical society, more like Britain. And New England was different uh, uh, because it, they, it was referred to as a leveling society where everyone was pretty much on the same plane. But what's interesting in Boston is you, it, was, it was a leading port. And uh, there were merchants were, were uh, very much tied to, to England because that's how they functioned. And so there was a deep... Uh, sense of loyalty to them. The French and Indian War had inspired loyalty to the crown. Every, even the, the, the most uh, outrageous patriots referred to England as home. It was a part of all their lives, even though they had never been there. And so um, this, was a, this was a difficult thing for them. You, you see the, the patriot leaders, such as John Adams, Samuel Cooper, suffering breakdowns in the years prior uh, to the outbreak of the revolution. As they wrestled 
with what does this mean? Because what they were saying is, as even after Bunker Hill, they, the, the claim was that we are loyal to the king. It is the ministerial army, the army of parliament that we are fighting. And the British soldiers would go, what are you talking about? You're, you know, what could, how can you come up with this distinction? But this is the distinction they clung to so that they could forestall that point of no return and declare independence. And I think that's unappreciated by how hard the revolution was, uh, even in New England, where it, there, there was a much stronger patriot side than, than to the South. There was still a lot of ambivalence. One of the, I'd like to end by uh, uh, quoting a sermon uh, that would be delivered just within weeks of the evacuation of the British by Dr. Samuel Cooper, who is one of the leading uh, patriots and a minister of the Brattle Street Me Meeting, which was the most well-off meeting in Boston and had been Joseph Warren's congregation. And Boston had been devastated during the siege. 9,000 British soldiers, uh, 3,000 civilians had occupied the city. 150 ships took them away and Bostonians flooded back. They found that the Old South meeting, you know, where they had met uh, before the Boston Tea Party, had been turned into a writing school. The pews had been pulled out and manure spread out. They discovered that uh, the house built by John Winthrop, you know, their first governor, uh, which served as a parsonage for the Old South meeting, had been burned for fuel, for firewood. Uh, it was traumatic, and everyone arrived, but Boston had survived. And in his sermon, the Reverend Samuel Cooper would, would say this, this sentence. Boston has been like the vision of Moses, a bush burning, but not consumed. Thank you.